with us today. Um, he has had a host of important jobs throughout the years uh, in Mexico at, the, uh, at various levels of responsibility, including in the city of Mexico um, and in the federal government. And I had the pleasure of getting to know him, uh, I guess, first a well when he took on the very difficult job of being undersecretary in the uh, goberna gobernacion uh, for handling uh, uh, human rights and a number of other very challenging cases and building uh, or issues and building a relationship with uh, Mexico's NGOs. Um, which he did establish a very good working relationship with them in very difficult times. And uh, then at the beginning of this year, he uh, took over as Secretary of Labor um, and, uh, and has uh, uh, done a very, uh, an excellent job in a period of time when we were negotiating uh, with uh, between the three countries of North America on a new treaty and have come up with a very a new and in, I, I think, very good labor chapter for the uh, replacement for the NAFTA treaty, um, which I'm sure we'll be able to talk to. Um, but uh, Se Secretary Campa is also going to talk about the achievements that have uh, taken place over the last six years in the field of employment and labor in Mexico, um, which I think you'll find very interesting. So entonces es un gran placer para mí. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Campa. Secretary Campa, who will now explain to you how issues of employment and labor have evolved in recent years in Mexico, including the new chapter with what is called the US uh, MCA. Uh, it's a little bit uh, awkward to uh, pronounce the acronym in Spanish, but I know that other new uh, names will be given to this free trade agree agreement. So welcome, Secretary, and I invite you now to tell us your story and your view of Mexico in recent times, the current situation, and the challenges vis-a-vis -vis this new free trade agreement and the new administration coming into office. Thank you and welcome here. Yes, thank you very much. I thank all of you for your time to listen to this presentation. First of all, allow me to do something a bit indiscreet. I hope it won't uh, make you uncomfortable, Ambassador uh, Wayne. Uh, Around 2013-2014, I met up with Ambassador Wayne at the uh, event inaugurating some security facilities uh, near Mexico City, and I asked him, the Ambassador whether he watched House of Cards, that American TV series, and the Ambassador told me yes, he did. So I asked him whether U.S. policy was really as harsh as it appeared on House of Cards. And the ambassador told me, no, it's worse. So it really is a privilege to be here with all of you. And good afternoon, everyone. I will try to strike a balance in terms of telling you about the results of the labor policy of this last six years of uh, the outgoing administration. It's always hard to t tell you about uh, results that we find positive after an election process that we find so complex as what we have. In, uh, but we discussed this with the Vice President of Colombia very shortly before uh, the end of that administration when he explained to me the results of the Santos administration, which had been reelected four years prior and had been, will had been able to negotiate a peace agreement and had won the Nobel Peace Prize. However, the 
candidate identified with him won less than 10 points in the second round and totally uh, candidates totally the opposite from him went to the second round of voting and so we saw this despite the fact that, that uh, there's a need to be part of governments that had that lost elections and to explain how we did things during our administrations because i I must tell you that one of the risks is that an elections result like this may do away with all of the progress and efforts made in a country to try to move forward. And this is why, to a large degree, that I am here with you today to try to explain to you what happened in Mexico within the labor market and the labor world over these past six years. First, the current administration has historic results in terms of creating formal jobs, jobs in the formal sector. This administration proposed the creation of four million new jobs in the formal sector, and we thought that that was going to be an impossible goal to achieve. And now, um, if we add this to the previous years, there was three over the previous 12 years of the prior administrations, they just created 3.5 million jobs. Uh, so 1.2 and 2.3, uh, the first under Fox and the second under Calderon. And their goal for us to have a goal of creating 4 million jobs in the formal sector seemed impossible. And the fact is that we are actually achieving that goal. And the graph before you has information through the last day of September. We're at uh, virtually 3.9. And with the information that we have the, from the Social Security Institute, we know that we're now beyond 4 million. We're at about 700,000 jobs more in a six-year period than what they were able to create in terms of jobs in the formal sector in the prior 12 years. The source of this information is uh, the registry, registration of people in the Social Security Institute in Mexico. Each of these individuals has a first and last name. They have a Social Security number, and they have a savings account for retirement. They have access to credit for consumer loans, uh, for housing. This is not a survey, which is now so in vogue in my country. And this is a precise statistic, because each one of these people has a first and last name and rights. In other words, there is no margin of error. These are the Social Security Institute's records in the country, and the figure that we have achieved is unprecedented. And I insist that more than 4 million new jobs have been created, which is 700,000 more in just six years than in the prior 12 years. There was also a major effort to incorporate into the labor force uh, Women, more than 43% of the new jobs has been have been for women, which is 1.7 million, and the rate of women entering the workforce has been the highest. Uh, has it been even higher than that of men? Here, uh, we have the information: 57% has been as men, and 43% women. A very significant part of these new jobs were the result of a policy to convert jobs in the informal sector and bring them into the formal sector. In Mexico, we do not have a serious problem of unemployment. The unemployment rates in Mexico are relatively low, and they are amongst the lowest of the countries that we have uh, trade relations with. The issue is that the labor market in our country uh, is so reliant on the informal sector. Since our administration started, there's been a 37 percent reduction in unemployment, and the economically active population in Mexico is 55.6 million, 96.9 percent are working, and that means 53.8 million. So that is the reduction that we've seen in the recent years. This graph shows the drop in unemployment, and you can see that we are frankly at a very low rate. If you compare this uh, to the rest of the world, Mexico is the f uh, fourth-ranking country in terms of unemployment of uh, the OECD 
countries, and this is lower than the OECD average, which is 5.3 percent, and it's lower than that of the United States, which is 3.9 percent, and less than that of Canada, which is 6 percent. I reiterate that Mexico's problem is that of the informal sector, a large number of people who work in the informal sector. Now, in formal sector in our country accounts for more than 30 million people, and what I can tell you is that our changes to the federal labor law of 2012 contributed to reducing employment in the informal sector by around three percentage points between December of 2012 and the second quarter of 2018. The problem of the informal sector in Mexico is that it's not uniform. The next slide gives information about uh, uh, how the informal sector plays out in our country. There are 10 entities within our country that have a, an informal employment rate between 20 and 40 percent and 49 percent, and 19 that have a rate between 50 and 74 percent, and three entities within our country, that is to say three states, have an uh, informal employment rate between 75 and 89 percent. So the states that have the lowest informal employment rate are the states that have been able to enter the modern era and have a different form of employment. These are the most highly industrialized states, but the less industrialized states are the ones in which only two out of ten people are wor actually working in the formal sector. So if in these states we eliminate uh, government employment, we would find that virtually there is no other option uh, for formal employment. The government is the only formal employer. This graph shows you how we were able to reduce the informal employment in by state over these past six years. In most of the states, with the exception of five of them, there has been a significant reduction in uh, informal employment. The most uh, uh, prominent one is Guanajuato, which had a 10 percent reduction in the informal employment, and the states that have an increase are Veracruz, Chiapas, Campeche, and the place where we've seen an in this is where we've seen an increases. Uh, including Tabasco. The next slide has information on informal employment uh, throughout the world. According to the ILO, more than 60 percent of the world's working population works in the informal economy. Mexico is below that rate. However, we face significant challenges in this area. The informal employment rate in Mexico is amongst between 70 to 54 percent. There are countries in Africa that have more than 90 percent of their employment in the informal sector, and less than 20 percent is found in the U.S. and uh, Western Europe. So uh, once again, Mexico still does have a very high informal employment rate. So what happened to salaries and wages during this period in our country? Mexico had the most significant recovery in the minimum wage uh, during this period in the past 40 years. Here you can see the behavior of the purchasing power of the minimum wage. There have been significant reductions during the 82 to 88 uh, administrations, also 88 to 94, and there continue to be reductions in 94 to 2000. There was a slight uh, recovery in the Fox administration, marginal improvement under Calderon, and a very significant recovery during the current administration, more than 16 percent. Mexico went from 60 um, pesos uh, to 88 um, pesos uh, for minimum wage. I don't have a conversion of pesos to dollars on purpose, because what we're going to do later, what I'm going to try to do is demonstrate to you how much that minimum wage can purchase within our country and how Mexican salaries compare to 
um, their purchasing power. What I can tell you is that of the 20 million workers in our social security system, virtually none of them earns the minimum wage. In Mexico today, there is practically no formal worker who earns uh, the minimum wage. A significant part gets more than one and up to three times the minimum wage. And 3.5 million workers uh, have uh, three to five uh, times the minimum wage, and 4.5 million workers earn more than five times the minimum wage and up to 25 times the minimum wage. And that is the performance that we've seen with minimum wage in our country. The next slide provides information regarding growth depending on the percentage of income. How, how um, uh, it, uh, the creation of jobs by salary range or wage range. We often hear that you create a lot of jobs and that more than four million jobs are going to be created. However, people, uh, we lost in terms of well-paid jobs. In fact, this is information that is upheld in the statistics, but you don't actually see it in practice. This has not occurred in Mexico in recent years. There has not been a wage reduction in Mexico, nor did this occur that people have lost uh, well-paid uh, jobs. We cannot find any information about the disappearance of well-paid jobs. What did actually happen? What happened is that the increase in the minimum wage that we imposed during this administration uh, set a different parameter. And what we see here on this slide, for example, is that in terms of jobs that pay between one and two minimum wages, they went from uh, five points, uh, almost 5.7 million to 8 million. But this uh, previously had been 3,600 pesos. Uh, but then the sal minimum wage went up to 5,375 pesos. So the parameter changed because of an increase in the minimum wage. So there's a significant number of workers who, when you compare them to the minimum wage, are slightly lower. But essentially, that is because we increase the minimum wage, which does, is not necessarily reflected in um, the wages offered in contracts. But I'd like to show you more information about this with the next slide. This slide shows the minimum wage in the bottom line, which is just slightly below the uh, minimum welfare determined by CONAVAL. I'm certainly th th certain that you know CONAVAL is an independent entity that assesses social policy within our country. And it has determined that 98 pesos is the minimum required by an individual, a, a worker, to maintain his or her family. And the minimum wage is actually slightly below that um, benchmark. But in the blue, you see double the minimum wage, two minimum wages. And those are the people who are in the least in our country. And the green line is the average of everyone who is currently employed in our country in the formal sector and receiving Social Security. This is 352 pesos. So the performance of or these trends have shown a clear improvement. We cannot say that the workers are happy with what they earn because they do earn relatively little, of course, compared to our trading partners. But we do have enough information to say that the workers are better off. And naturally, the people who have moved from the informal to the formal sector have taken a qualitative step forward, because the informal sector of our economy offers the lowest possible salaries. And moving from the informal to the formal sector also means that in addition to wages, one gets health care. Uh, uh, guaranteed for the entire family. It also means that one has a retirement saving, access to a retirement saving system, which may seem small, but at the end of the day is an uh, amount of money which will 
make it possible for them to take out loans once they're no longer economically active, and it also gives them access to housing loans. So um, the number of formal workers with the minimum wage has also increased uh, tremendously in our country in recent age, starting in 1997, when we had 1.5 million people, 14.8% uh, of workers that were in the formal sector uh, earning a minimum wage. And now we have 0 0.1. According to the Social Security records, there are 12 um, uh, 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 so that means that there's almost no one in the formal sector of the economy in Mexico is earning just the uh, minimum wage. The big, I reiterate again, once again that the big challenge that we face is the informal sector. So about 7 percent of people in the formal sector earn the minimum wage, and that's just a little bit more than 4 million people. Now, I was also s talking about the statistical distortion that is created because of the increase in the minimum wage. We often hear that, oh, we lost so many million good jobs in recent years. This graph shows the actual trends in the minimum wage vis-a-vis -vis the negotiation of uh, wage contracts. We see they're between 4 to 6 percent negotiated this way, and the minimum wage starting in 2016 increased by 21 percent. So since this is the parameter that determines uh, the salary range that an individual falls into, that uh, this means that many people, for, for example, earn a double the minimum wage and then um, were in a contract negotiations and they earned something less than minimum wage. Well, they have had an increase, about four, or t uh, six to four percent increase. But now, if you compare this to the minimum wage increase of 21 percent, that explains why they're in a different uh, minimum wage category. One of the responsibilities of the Secretary of Labor is to um, facilitate reconciliation in labor negotiations. We talk about labor peace. And this slide shows how this has behaved. And we're looking at strikes in our country compared to um, uh, calls for a strike. In recent years, we have not uh, had as many negotiations with them, but we've been much more effective in reconciliation to resolve conflicts through reconciliation without having to resort to strikes. I was only at the Secretary for 11 months. I arrived in January, and I've had no federal strikes, and that's never happened with any secretary any labor secretary. Now, I've only been in this position for 11 months. Well, there was a secretary who was there for 11 years, but he had 2,000 strikes. Secretary Navarrete was there for five years, and there were 21 strikes. The capacity we have had, based on very clear guidelines, to look for conciliation in all cases possible, this has meant that we are focusing on resolving any conflict in order to address it in a timely fashion. And I think that this slide clearly shows uh, how we've had almost no strikes when we had a percentage of 2% in Carlos Salinas, um, half uh, a percent with the DUN Fox, and then there was a reduction in Calderon's government and 0.03% during these last years. We've made a great effort. Uh, we have had many negotiations of 43,000 calls for strike, actually. During this administration and under me, 5,000 calls for strikes. But we've been able to resolve all of these situations through dialogue and conciliation. One issue that I think is extremely important to address, especially in light of the discussion that we had uh, 
under the USMCA agreement. This has to do with union freedom in our country because the negotiation, or labor negotiations, at the end was focused on issues that had to do with union freedom. For some time now, this vision that these protection contracts of the unions in Mexico's in Mexico have a, an influence over trade, and so an investor that could take his money to Mexico, Canada, or the U.S. goes to Mexico, uh, well, this can actually depend on a workers' uh, stances. During recent years, and we've seen this in the slide, well, we've had a great change with regard to union freedom. And we see the workers who were registered in unions in recent years. We had a percentage of new unions uh, between 100 and 200 for many years. Then under Calderon, there were 388 new unions registered. And now, we have more than 740 new unions that have registered in our country. This information, what it seeks to do, is to show you that almost all requests uh, for registration of new unions presented to the federal government in Mexico are usually uh, favorably resolved. All of this information is on the internet, it's public. Any union that asks to be registered has the right to have this information published. And we publish the information, the decisions we make, um, and you can see this on our website, in the Secretariat's website. And so a great deal has been achieved with regard to transparency and democracy uh, as far as unions are concerned. But we need to make more headway in future years based on the constitutional changes made last year and the negotiations carried out with the United States and Canada. The information that you see here is the time needed uh, to respond to these requests, these union request registrations in Mexico. There were 776 requests received and 92 percent uh, were actually uh, favorably resolved. And today, if a union wants to register, it usually takes less than four days. Uh, as of 2016, the average has been one day. The changes in union leadership, and 90 percent are considered to meet requirements, and we do this in less than one day. Changes in the bylaws, we uh, do this in one day. Uh, reports on membership or requests for certified copies, less than one day. So we've made uh, great efforts to make uh, transparent all this information about union registration. That has been a demand uh, for quite a long time, uh, supposedly because of a lack of union freedom. Now here's some data that has to do with uh, on the job accidents and sickness. We've had market reduction in recent years. And I'd like to specifically refer to a program that we developed in Mexico. It's a voluntary program. The accident on the accident rate is 2.4 percent, and the program for uh, health or occupational health in Mexico is a volunteer. We have two ways uh, to do this. Well, we have inspectors that go to businesses to make sure everything is all right, and then we have a voluntary program where businesses voluntarily uh, sign up to the program, and they must comply with a series of requirements. The businesses that are in this program have less than 
half of the on-the-job accidents as compared to those businesses that do not participate in the program. And we have emphasized that it's important for businesses to voluntarily meet requirements. Uh, we want them to meet their obligations uh, with regard to on-the-job health and security. Now, just a few final comments. First of all, this has to do with the 2012 labor reform, which Ambassador Wayne knows very well. He was a protagonist in this process with us. This 2012 reform, uh, well, we proposed uh, to give access to the labor market, make uh, businesses more productive, and ensure that productivity also led to better salaries for employees, better union freedom, uh, supervision, gender equity, no discrimination, and also modernization of labor justice, as well as creation of employment, of course. We believe that uh, we have seen very positive results in all of these areas. Briefly, I'd like to refer to this labor reform and the constitutional reforms of 2016. What's pending now, which needs to be approved in, in the next few weeks, uh, has to do with labor justice. In 2017, there was a constitutional reform for three things. First, to change labor justice. In Mexico, we have had an administrative justice system uh, with arbitration and conciliation boards. The Constitution now orders that labor justice uh, be in the hands of the judicial branch that judges actually rule on labor conflicts. Uh, second change, which is fundamental, the Constitution now provides that decisions of unions, all decisions, decision to create a union, to elect uh, leaders, to sign a collective bargaining contract must be due through a secret and free vote of workers. The second component of the reform, which is now part of the Constitution, the signing of a collective bargaining contract uh, must be done by leaders that are voted on secretly and fairly by individual workers. The next component, a new system for registering unions, one at a national level, no local uh, registrations, just one institute that is charged with uh, labor life throughout the country. And they are also responsible for conciliating labor conflicts. There is this possibility of having conciliation at a state level, but they have no powers with regard to registration. Now, the secondary legislation is still pending. It should be concluded before this year is out. But w one data point that's important, while in the case of labor justice, we have the courts and we have this institute we are creating, we still need this law to go into force. We still need to approve secondary laws. Uh, this with regard, uh, now with regard to union democracy, that is not pending, that is in force. It's not an opinion, rather. That's what the judges have ruled. Judges have ruled uh, just recently that the secondary legislation does not need to be approved so that the law be effective with regard to the individual secret vote of workers to elect their leaders. Thus, the last revisions done, the last elections done in unions were done using a secret vote. Even if the bylaws of the unions did not provide for that, we had an important election in the oil union recently, and the bylaws of that union did not include the secret vote. And what we told the union is that part of the bylaw uh, today is not applicable. It must be subject to the Constitution. Thus, it must be respecting the democratic principles of the Constitution with regard to renewal of leadership.
Now, these issues are clearly linked to the labor chapter annex of USMCA. The process of negotiations that we had was very complex, and at the end of the day, the issue that was left pending almost to the end was the issue of union freedom. All the other issues, we were able to work them out and agree to them, but the issue that was the stumbling block and required greatest effort was union freedom, especially with regard to collective bargaining. What was included in the annex of this agreement were the principles which are provided for now in the Constitution. and principles derived from legal precedent, which has to do with contracts that are in force. So it was uh, decided that contracts that are signed as of today must be done providing for these democratic principles in the Constitution. But what about all the other contracts that were already signed under a different kind of legislation and are now in f are still in force? I'm sure many of you know that there is a principle in our Constitution which means that uh, legal provisions cannot be retroactive, but there is legal precedent. Uh, new legal acts mean that authorities can demand that certain principles need to be provided for in contracts or in other uh, legal vehicles. So, for example, workers must have free and individual voting when they uh, vote for their leadership um, uh, in the unions. And this is under the annex of the agreement. Mexico stated that it would take four years uh, in order to revise all of the contracts which are in force at this time. Now, I'd like to just refer to a last point, which has to do with uh, the Canada-Mexico Temporary Agricultural Workers Program. Now, this is a program that is 40 years old, and between 56 and 28,000 Mexican workers go to Canada to work every year. This is a circular program. The workers go for six to eight months. And just some data points that we believe are important. The rate of return of these workers is 100%. There is not one worker that stays in Canada in breach of what was agreed to. Eight to 10 are repeating in other words, they're asked for again. They all go with a contract. They all go in by plane in Canada. They come back by plane to Mexico. And I am mentioning this because we believe it's a, an important model which could facilitate uh, migrant workers coming to the U.S. And I just am pointing out the important data points. This year, we are sending 28,000 workers approximately to Canada. They all work in the agricultural sector. They are um, almost all men. We are trying to increase the number of women. Only 4% are women. And 100% of these workers go back to Mexico when their contract terminates. Just some months ago, I had the opportunity to go to Canada and I talked with Congress members, uh, politicians, uh, all kinds of people, and it was very pleasing to hear only positive assessments, not just of these workers' uh, performance at these farms in Canada, but also their civic uh, commitment. Uh, to those where they lived, and it's very Im important for us because it means that they can have access uh, to uh, means, uh, they maintain their ties to their family members, 
And I am convinced after having worked uh, many years on issues of violence, another one of the factors that explains the breakdown in many communities that we have seen has to do with the breakdown of links with the community and communities that were left with uh, uh, no mm, heads of household. Uh, where they're just children, just women, um, and I think this explains to some extent the violence uh, that we are experiencing experience in our country. Um, and well, uh, we have uh, this program, which is very productive. Uh, these are workers that go back to Mexico, and they maintain their ties to community and family. This year, we have strengthened this program. It's 40 years old. But 35 percent of all the workers uh, were sent under our administration, so we have strengthened our ties with Canada and Canadian employers. These are just some of uh, the elements of our administration's labor policy. We think that we've had very positive results uh, that we are giving to the next administration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary. I would like to ask you some preliminary questions, and, and then I'd like to open up the floor for our colleagues. You mentioned the USMCA, and I know that this has come up in an article uh, that had to do with the migrant caravan. I think that the USMCA can improve the relations between the United States, uh, Central America, and Mexico. And perhaps a program like the one you mentioned can really help. It can help workers uh, have a good job. Uh, and I think that this program has been very successful, the one between Mexico and Canada. Uh, two more questions. What is more important from your perspective? The reduction of informality in Mexico, because that's a, an important problem. What can be done to face future challenges? for example, in developing the workforce. It's clear that Mexico, Canada, and the United States are going to face these challenges, the wave of new technology, for example. This is going to mean that workers must have different skills. These are workers of any country. In other words, if they want to be competitive on the global scene, and we don't have many programs of this kind in Mexico. There's some in the U.S. and Canada. Of course, not enough in our countries either. But there's a lot to do in Mexico in this regard. This is a way to create em employment now and also to create jobs in the future. In five years, workers will be asked to have these technological skills. And so if you could speak to these two issues, of course, Ambassador, the recipe to reduce rates of informal employment, well, based on our experiences last years, has to do with two things. First, simplify. Make an effort so that it's easy to make workers formal. And that there be follow-up and verification of employers who still have employees in the informal sector. It has to do with confidence and the ability to create jobs and opportunities and a vision which looks toward that. 
we have states in our country that you know well, Ambassador, that have rates of informal employment that are like the third world, Coahuila, uh, Baja California. What these states have done is uh, to commit to actually getting investment and creating opportunities. Now that we've modernized the job portal, and we've looked for information not only of those who are seeking employment, but also those who train workers and experts. And we see that states that are now n number one in training experts or technical people, well, they actually have a greater number of informal employees. Veracruz, for example, th they've done great in training people, but many of these workers go to different states to work. So we need to make an effort with these states to create conditions of confidence so that businesses go to these states. We also need to understand that there is no better social policy than job creation policy with regard to transfer of resources can actually help many problems, but the substantive problems are resolved by creating opportunities and jobs, and we trust that that will be our future in upcoming years. I agree with you, Ambassador. We are very far in countries like Mexico we're far from being ready for the technological revolution that is exponentially growing. We have seen signs in, con in companies like Bimbo, which is a bread and bakery company, and they have a commitment with the unions, the jobs that are lost. This is the commitment in any production phases because of technological advances must be recovered in other phases, for example, the distribution phase. This is a commitment of the company with their workers. Of course, we are far from being able to really deal with this. Even industrialized countries um, are a long way from being ready for this revolution, but countries like ours are even uh, less ready. We have some months ago organized a forum uh, with uh, workers, employers, and union leaders uh, to talk about the future. And the conclusion is, is that we have to make uh, incredible efforts to be able to face this challenge. So are there any questions? Uh, Greg Huger, I'm the d Regional Director of the Peace Corps for Latin America and the Pacific. Thank you for your presentation. Congratulations on the achievements of your administration. It's impressive to see the stati statistics that you presented. I recently went to Mexico, and I went to factories, I went to universities, and so I saw in first person what you were explaining here with your slides. Considering the challenge that Central American countries are facing, and also given the recent agreement between U.S., Mexico, and Canada, how do you see collaboration between our three countries with regard to supporting Central American countries so that they can make the same kind of progress in those countries as Mexico has made in recent years? Although This migrant caravan that's crossing Mexico now may be motivated by different reasons. The ambassador of Honduras has been in communication with us, and it seems 
that uh, there may be political reasons uh, that have actually created this caravan. But of course, there are the conditions that the population is facing in these three countries. What we cannot deny is that uh, Central America is uh, in bad shape. We've seen drought there recently, violence. And if we are not able to change these conditions, we're going to have this migratory pressure, which is very intense. And in this part of our hemisphere, we do see that despite efforts to stop migrants from coming in, but despite the walls and the border controls, they end up entering. So I think that the effort should also be made to change the conditions on the ground in these three countries, because if we don't, regardless of any political motivation that may have to do with this, the migratory flows are going to grow. And I think the three countries who signed the agreement must be involved. We are extremely interested in this because we are uh, one of the countries most affected by this. Most of these immigrants do not want to stay in Mexico. Uh, most want to go into the United States. They may want to go to different states, but their destination or their desired destination is the United States. And so we need to change the game on the ground. Commitments have been undertaken, but I think little has been done to actually change the conditions on the ground, poverty, marginalization, and the violence that we see. If uh, I'd like to be allowed a question in the second round afterwards, please. Anyone else? Uh, we have people here who have contributed to a report on these issues recently in the whole developing world. Anna works at CSIS, another think tank here. They've done a study on the challenges of the workforce in various parts of the world. Please take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your presentation. My question is about the future of work and new technology. Aren't you concerned about how uh, new technology can have an impact on all of the progress you've made in Mexico in terms of new jobs in the formal sector? Are you concerned about this, and is your secretary preparing for this? Do you have a strategy on the future of work? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you. The information that we have and the preparations being made in the entities that have been studying the information from the OECD, for example, uh, they see that a lot of the jobs that we now have in our countries based on this exponential technology revolution is going to be extraordinary. Uh, their projections, uh, well, I don't have their statistics, but the number of jobs that may be lost is uh, staggering. I am quite convinced, and as the OECD's uh, specialist studies also say, uh, our countries are far from being able to handle, uh, while the developing countries aren't ready to handle this, we are even less ready. And in the future, well, the future is coming now, and the problem with these changes is they are exponential. In previous years, it took a long time 
uh, to evolve and change. And now things are changing at a dizzying speed. And it is a risk. I am convinced that we do face a risk here. I'm also convinced that we are not ready to handle this. And that's why I'm saying that we, along with the OECD and CONACYT, recently convened people to discuss this matter with the business owners and with the workers. And our conclusion is that we need to hurry up and get ready to work on this. We are concerned about it. We've also placed this on the table with the transition to the new administration. As I was telling the ambassador, we are undergoing a very intense process of transition to the new administration. I've had almost 20 meetings with the incoming secretary, and one of the things that we placed on the table has to do with 4T revolution, exponential technology changes, and instead, we need to get started seriously looking at handling the situation in Mexico. Any other questions? All right, then I have a question. Um, uh, w w what do you expect in laws before January 1st? The, the reform will bring about a tremendous number of changes in several laws. First, we have the federal labor law. The 2012 reforms touched uh, one just one-third of the federal labor law. It includes more or less 1,000 articles, and about 300-some of them were amended in, two th in the 2012 change. But the change that needs to be made now because of the amendments to the Constitution implies more than four, will bring in more than 400 articles. In some cases, they're very simple changes. In other cases, they are very significant changes because it requires changing the procedure that we have followed thus far in order to move from um, the reconciliation boards to the labor courts. And so there's an issue with the re uh, registration. This is a new law. We have to change the organic law on uh, public law and to move it to the judicial branch. It's a package of about six laws. And the essential part, I believe, is to make way for the changes in the system of justice in the labor courts to make sure that they operate well, that it works well. Every day in the Board of uh, Reconciliation Arbitration, some 800 cases come in. That's just before the board. At the local boards, there are more than some 550,000 collective bargaining agreements. And with all of their limitations, now we have a system of labor justice that is working, I would say, relatively well. What we need to ensure is that the change changes for the better, that we have a better system of labor justice with the new reforms, and that the courts that will be created have enough resources to ensure that everything works properly. The other fundamental change shall be the implementing legislation to make sure that trade union democracy uh, well, we know that there will be changes and uncertainty that always comes along with democracy, but we need to make sure to respect the freedom of choice of the workers, but we don't want to fall from one extreme to, an, uh, to extremes, which would create unnecessary labor instability. The fact of the matter is that some things, Ambassador, that were included in the treaty, and they say that these are uh, binding for all three countries are only binding for Mexico. It is a legal framework that goes even beyond the rules governing uh, trade union life in the other countries. As I was telling you a moment ago, what we face today in uh, labor in our country is a s legal scaffolding and an institutional scaffolding that facilitates and favors reconciliation and harmony. The risk is to go to the other extreme 
and to have a legal scaffolding and an institutional structure that gives political messages that might jeopardize harmony and stability. You were uh, talking to me about something a moment ago about uh, the way that the countries complement each other within the treaty. I am convinced that the origin of the free trade agreement for North America, uh, the NAFTA rather, in the 1990s, is more a reflection of asymmetry than symmetry. Those asymmetries are what cause the countries to complement each other so in order to handle the situation uh, or to uh, uh, consolidate against other trading blocks uh, that are competing in the world. The competition isn't between Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Rather, it's this trade block compared to other trade blocks. Consequently, the new treaty, based on this logic, particularly in the wage chapter, has to follow consistent legislation and I think that that will be the way to prevent us from having labor instability in our countries in the coming years. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Secretary. In the new agreement, there is a set of salaries that have to be $16 an hour in the automotive industry. Realistically speaking, how many of those jobs can truly remain in Mexico? I think that that component of the treaty is more related to trade logic than to labor and wage logic. This is a way of saying that those components uh, have to originate in the United States or Canada. But the more friendly way to state it in the treaty was by uh, breaking it down into salary terms or wage terms. No one thinks that we can increase our wages to that uh, level in Mexico. So in fact, what we were seeking and what we achieved was to expand the component produced, the comp automobile components produced in the United States and Canada through this treaty. This was a sample central component of the position of the United States. And that's how it was enshrined in the treaty. And I'm convinced that this is linked more to trade issues than labor issues. In the labor discussion, we never got into wages. In the labor discussion, we touched on other issues that are essentially related to a system of justice, to an, uh, uh, rights, uh, justice, and democracy. And quite certainly, democracy and trade union transparency are going to pressure employers to offer better wages. But no one can uh, imagine that we could raise our wages to that level. But it's uh, really a treaty based on asymmetry in order to uh, uh, make the three countries complementary to compete with other regions. Uh, no microphone. I believe he's saying something about $5 an hour. What was the average pay in automobile factories in Mexico now? I don't want to give you the wrong information. I don't have the exact figure right now. However, what it is important to mention is that the best negotiations in recent years regarding salaries or wages and the best negotiation regarding revenue uh, on uh, production bonuses are found in the automobile and mining industries. All right, anyone else? Two more? As regards migration from the Northern Triangle, is there a plan for labor insertion for migrants? That's one question. Also, now that you are leaving office, what is your biggest concern regarding the labor market in Mexico? And what is your highest hope for the future? 
We are very close to signing an agreement uh, with the four countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Mexico, to establish a set of criteria for labor mobility within the region. And this would be a model similar to that of what we have with Canada, a system which would be a government-to-government -government program in all cases to facilitate the movement of workers within the region. I am confident that before we leave, we can conclude it. We've been engaged in a very intense dialogue with all of the uh, ministers of labor and foreign uh, relations and security, and I'm certain that this will be ready before we leave office. This is also something that the next administration is aware of and agrees with. It seems to me that the main challenges that we have, one, is what you and the ambassador were talking about, which is the uh, technological revolution, which is fundamental. And I think that the other major challenge is how to move forward on issues of labor democracy or trade union democracy without losing the labor harmony that we've enjoyed in our country recently, which has enabled us to create so many jobs. I think that that is a big challenge facing the incoming administration, according to uh, or in light of the power that the secretary has at this point in time. Uh, that answer answered my question. So I don't need to ask it again. Very well. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much.